He is. You could do better than that. Praise the Lord this morning. Welcome to this Labor Day weekend worship service. I know some of you won't be working Monday, and that certainly hurts your feelings. But if you want something to do, come by my house. We'll put you to work. It's good to see you this morning. Praise the Lord. It's good to see a good crowd on Labor Day weekend, missing a few folks out of town, running around, doing other stuff. But we're glad that you're here. Uh, a couple things I want to remind you of. One, we start a new series this Wednesday night in our worship service here at the Spring Campus, which I will be preaching and teaching, all right, called Reconnecting with God. If you've been looking for a place and a time to recharge your spiritual batteries and just want to get back into some things that just get back to the basics of loving Jesus and being on fire for God, don't miss this series. It'll get you going in the middle of the week, especially you make it through Friday, all right? Might even get you all the way to Sunday. Come join us. It's a one-hour worship service. We call it our Dive Deeper service. It's seven. It's over at eight, and you'll go home and do whatever you need to do, all that other good stuff. But come be a part of a worship service. We have child care. We youth have our, their, their home lift groups and everything that goes on Wednesday nights, and we have our, our midweek Bible study. So come be a part as we talk about reconnecting with God. Also, you will notice in the bulletin, it's this long little sleeve of, of a card called uh, Believer's Fellowship, a journey into experiencing Believer's Fellowship. Uh, you Go ahead and hit that for me if you would. I'll, I'll get to this in a minute. If you haven't been to 201 class, you need to come be a part of this. Maybe you've been through our 101, and, uh, but that's as far as you ever got. 101 is about membership, what the body of Christ is all about at Believer's Fellowship. Uh, 201 gets you into some more specific things in regard to your own spiritual life and habits and disciplines. So many times where we fail and where we make our biggest mistake is just leaving off some of those important and nece necessary disciplines for our spiritual life. And we're going to talk about how to develop some spiritual habits in your life that will help you keep growing and going for the Lord. This has a lot to do with spiritual maturity. It's only about an hour and a half class, hour and 15 minute class. Uh, it's, it's Sunday, this, uh, what is it, next Sunday, the 9th? Come be a part of this service, but we need to get you to sign up. That's what the card's for. So if you're going to come, be a part of our 201, or maybe you've been 100 years ago and you just want to come again, fill it out, sign it, put it back in the offering receptacle as you leave today, because we have to have a count, especially if you have children coming. We need to have child care workers in place and all those kind of good stuff. Plus, we feed you a snack, and so we need to have the appropriate amount of drinks and snacks and stuff here. Come, sign up, be a part of it. I think you'll be blessed for just coming. All right? Somebody say Amen. Let me get all these little buttons right. If I remember how to work this one, it's a new one. I want to talk about a message, and this is not a series of messages, although it could be a series of messages, but it's just one message today on uh, the threats facing our families. Now, you know that just recently I did like a five-part series, I think it was, on dealing with moral issues. We talked about pornography. We talked about adultery. We talked about fornication. We talked about homosexuality. The last message was one called Pathway to Purity. All these are important messages, but this kind of leads up also to what I want to talk about in regard to today's sermon. Now, even though it's a one-parter, starting October the 1st, I'll be getting into four or five messages on uh, a, a message called uh, a sermon series called No Regret Parenting. So you'll, you don't want to miss that. If you have grandkids or kids or whatever, you need to come be a part of that service. You have friends and family who want more information about biblical parenting. We'll be talking about all this thing. But today, this home records message, as I said, it could be a series because I'm going to be talking about five things today that uh, each one of these could be a, easily be a series in itself. And whether you're married, single, divorced, or whatever, these will help you. So in, in the divorce situation, should you remarry, not repeating any past mistakes or making sure that those don't occur in your family? Or if you're, if you're looking to be married, it certainly lays out some groundwork because so many people that are young and in love just don't even think about some of these important issues. And these are some of the most important things that you need to have resolved and settled before you say, I do. So these are, these are good things, but what we're going to do, in fact, we're going to cover a lot of ground today, all right? Uh, as we talk about five important things, you're going to see when the five come up here in just a moment, just, uh, just how big each one of these topics really are, and they are vital keys in marriage. So let's look at, you know, what, what these five are. In fact, I just didn't come up with these out of my mind or out of my head. Just looking at uh, what top marriage counselors, sociologists, psychiatrists, psychologists were saying, counselors in general, about the five major conflicts in the home, they 
agree pretty much that these are the top five issues. If you look down the list, you see they're all important. Communication, money, parenting, sex, in-laws. These, the, these are the biggies. When people come in and sit down, or whether it's for Pastor Strickland or myself, and they start talking about marriage issues and what's going on in their relationships. After years and years of doing that and years and years of the marriage retreats, it really comes down many, many times that it's usually something in regard to these things. It may be something on the edge, but it's usually... Even if it is, it goes back to somewhere in the context of these five things. So as I said, each one of these could be a sermon in itself. But we're going we're to move fastly today, so take notes. We'll have them up on the screen for you because these are things that I would hope that if something rings a bell in your own life, and your own relationship, that you would have the, uh, the boldness as well as the, as well as the love to say, hey, I see that looming in my marriage. I want to deal with it. I want God to do something in, in, in my life. Our marriages should be a blessing. Isn't it interesting that most of the jokes you hear today are about marriage and divorce and in-laws and all those things in regard to marriage? In fact, I Googled up uh, jokes on marriage uh, yesterday just out of curiosity, and page after page after page. And then I looked at all of them, and I thought, you know, normally people sit and laugh at them, but many of them were just sad when you think about it, the stuff we laugh at. Marriage is not supposed to be sad, all right? It's supposed to be glad. It was an institution which God gave us in, in, in the first book of the Bible in Genesis, which should be a fulfilling, a successful, and a happy relationship. But you know as well as I, in the culture that we live in, that is not so. That's not the way it works today. Uh, and the church as well, we, we're affected by it many, many times. So let's, let's take a, a, a look. A brief look, though it may be, but let's take a look, and I pray that you'll take perhaps one or two of these things in your own life, as I say, have the courage to, to, to deal with them. So you got your ears ready and your pencil and your piece of paper ready? Let's, let's, look, let's start with number one, obviously, and I think this is probably the most important one. When you talk about communication, now I'm hitting the button, there we go. When you talk about communication, uh, if this isn't right, then so many other areas aren't right. Because if you can't learn to communicate and you can't learn to relate to one another verbally, then you've got some bigger problems. And when they occur, you're not going to be able to deal with them because you don't know how to relate. This is something that really should be learned in our homes as young children, but so often it's not. This is something that parenting should teach. This is something that even I believe we talk about our education system. They want to teach something worthwhile, teach people how to communicate. Teach them how to talk to one another. Teach them how to listen to one another. But let's talk in the context of marriage. And I say we're going to, we're going to hit some real fast subpoints in each of these. And there are five subpoints in this regard to, to how, how do I show and how do I express uh, communication. Well, the first thing is, is mutual concern. You've got to show that you really do care about communication. So how do you do that? How do you communicate genuine concern? Well, there's some obvious things we should learn uh, that you should get in, embraced under this context. One would be when you talk to people, you make eye contact. You show that you're listening by your affection. You show that you're listening even by your body language. We know what it's like to have a body language that shows you're not listening. The countenance, the look on your face, the way you relate to someone just by the way you look when they're speaking, when you're not speaking. And when you do speak in regard to your voice, the level of your voice, the tone of your voice. Sometimes you know it's not what you say, it's how you say it. You can say, I'm sorry, but in the way you say it, not mean it at all. So we know that those things are important. The, the frequency of contact, that you, you learn to speak regularly with each other, you learn to take time for each other. I told my kids that very early on when the lessons Kathy and I learned in our marriage was that when I came home, my kids knew that was mom and dad time, that I could sit down with her, find out what's going on in the family, find out what's going on with her, what's going on with the kids. And the kids learned to respect those first moments when dad's at home, those first 15, 20, sometimes 30 minutes until mom and dad had time to relate to what was happening in the world around us. And then obviously your attitude toward being a servant in the family. If, if you're that kind of a narcissistic personality that you think everybody's just there for you, then you're going to miss a genuine communication and what communicating and relating to somebody is really all about. Then obviously, sensitivity to people's hurts and desires, their inner needs. 
you got to realize that inside this shell of a being is a person, that we are not just a, a, a body, that we are a soul and a body, and the body is just a vehicle to carry the soul. And you need to realize that when you married that person, you just didn't marry their body, you married them. And they're in there, and they want to relate to you, and so you learn to relate to each other. So the first point of communication is, is uh, mutual concern. The second point of communication is intellectual devotion. You say, what's that mean? That has to do with listening. Hearing, not just having, you know, the vibration of sound waves bounce off the inner ear and the eardrum and make noises down to your brain. You know, some of you haven't learned that communication of listening. I remember the Charlie Brown commercials and the Charlie Brown uh, TV shows, the specials that come on each year. You, you read about Snoopy in the paper and everything. You, you ever listen to, how, when the, uh, to the show and the parents are talking to Charlie Brown, how it sounds? <laughs> Now, unfortunately, that's the way your spouse sounds to some of you. You come home and it's because you haven't learned to listen. And if you take the time to say, hey, I, I need to learn what it means to be a listener. And there is a difference. One, if you're just hearing, hearing is, is, is a physiological, uh, you know, uh, function of, of the ear, the sound waves bounce off, but listening goes beyond that. It's a devotion to, to really paying attention to what the ear is picking up. What are those vibrations saying? What's going on? If you can learn to be a listener, you can learn some of the first steps to communication and some of the most important steps to communication. Another thing is verbal affirmation. And this has to do with recognizing people giving praise, giving admiration, you know, patting people on the back, especially your spouse, thanking them, praising God for them to their face and so that they hear you saying it. And you ought to be doing that not just when, you know, that there's this obvious factor that you see that they deserve some admiration or praise, but just all the time, even when you don't feel like it. That paves the way for so many other things in the context or within the arena of what genuine communication is really all about. There's lots of excuses. I've heard a bunch of them. People say, you know, well, uh, if, if I start praising them because I don't do it, if I just, they'll just think I'm faking it. Do it anyway. Amen. Well, you know, they, they won't appreciate it. There you missed the mark already. All right, it's not about what you get back, the feedback from it. It's what you're going to do as service and honoring and caring about somebody else. Well, you know, I just don't think it's masculine like that to be blessing my wife and praising her. Then you don't understand what it means to be a man. Amen. Somewhere you've got your signals mixed by maybe the way you're raised or by what you experience in your life. Some guy told me, well, you know, I just kind of feel funny when I start praising my wife or bragging about my mate. Then go ahead and feel funny. Because these are the things, if you're really serious about having communication and having a kind of marriage that God wants you to have, these are the kind of things that will open the door. All right, so it's, it's mutual concern, intellectual devotion, verbal affirmation. Another thing is loving confrontation. If you're going to communicate, somewhere down the line, there's going to be a conflict. But you can't be that person who just kind of, you know, the turtle method, just pull in your shell. And on the other hand, you can't be that, that skunk method where you spray everything every time you get mad. You know? you know? Some of you skunks and some of you turtles, all right? Some of you married a skunk and some of you married a turtle. But there has to be an understanding that, hey, there's going to be times we don't, we don't agree. I don't know what it is, but I'm sure there, there's, there's people within the congregation, you know, who say, well, you know, I, 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 just, I just see brother so-and-so's. I look at brother Tim and Rebecca's marriage, and they just never fuss, and they're just so perfect, and they just never have a disagreement about anything, and they just, I just, I, my marriage needs to be like that, because I just know if I have a disagreement, we just must be full of the devil. Let's resolve this right now. I want to ask Brother Tim to take the floor. But I can guarantee you that Tim and Rebecca have had some disagreements. Brother Joe and Kathy have had some disagreements. Brother Joe and Kathy have at least one or two a day. Do we get mad and divorce and throw rocks and slam doors? No. You have to learn how to have confrontation, but you have to learn how to, to, have, to show love in the confrontation. The Bible says you speak the truth in love. The Bible goes on in Proverbs to talk about this issue when it says this, you know, do not let kindness and don't let truth leave you. Bind them around your neck, write them on the table of your heart so you will find favor and good repute in the sight of God and man. How do you, how do you find good repute with your spouse? You, 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 you embrace kindness and truth. 
You embrace mercy and truth. There has to be a combination because sometimes truth may appear to be offensive when really you're just trying to help get things right. So yes, there can be confrontation, but there doesn't have to be animosity and there doesn't have to be wrath and bitterness and those things that follow. You have to learn how, if you're going to have a communication, how to have a loving confrontation because confrontation is all a part of it. You two are two unique individuals. God has made you one. Becoming that one sometimes requires some friction in a very negative sense. All right? So you learn how to have a loving confrontation and it takes discipline and it takes a person who's willing to say, I don't always have to be right. I know that's difficult. The fifth part of real communication gets into intimate discussions. Now, you know, my wife and I, we talk about a lot of things, but there's times when that talk gets more intense and it's more, it's more concerned about her as a person or me as a person and we're really reaching in and we're, we're touching a part of each other's lives that, that God intended for us to be a part of. We're not hiding things from each other. We're not sheltering things from each other. There's this, there's this truthfulness. There's this transparency that takes place. And the more that we have learned how to deal with these other issues like mutual concern and the learning how to listen and learning how to encourage one another and admonish each other and then even have a loving confrontation, then it, it opens the doors, you know, for, for these kind of relationships. The highlights of your marriage should be these kind of times when you're genuinely experiencing the oneness of that relationship that God wants you to experience. Communication, the number one issue. The second issue is money. Now, you just knew it would come up. It comes up in every marriage. It's always, a, uh, always an issue. Well, let me give you six quick important principles. And these are quick. You write them down. You may not be able to write fast enough. The first is the principle of ownership. These are truths, by the way, that will bring peace to your finances in your life and in your marriage. All right. I was at Dave Ramsey has that financial peace institute or university or whatever it is. But it really is. You take those basic biblical principles, apply them to your life. And there's peace. Principle number one is God owns it. Who owns it? Who owns it? If you're here and you're married and your spouse is here, look at him and say, God owns it. Go ahead, tell him, God owns it. Your car, your clothes, your house, your shoes, your children. Everything you own, it's not yours. It's God's. God owns it. The Bible says the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. That means everything in it, it all belongs to God. God, God owns it all. And if you can establish that premise first and foremost, you'll start handling it a little more Honestly, a little more carefully and a little bit more righteously. God owns everything. And by the way, in case you miss the everything, that includes you. God owns you. You've been bought with a price. Now, the second part of this is if you follow the Genesis chapter one, God creates the earth and then he puts man on the earth and he makes man a steward or a manager of the planet. God owns everything. God puts us in charge of handling it righteously and properly. Those two principles right there will transform your finances. Now, some people, I don't know those things. It's not knowing them, it's applying them. It's not just having some information up here in your brain. It's having the practical flow of the information into your life, which brings a transformation, which brings a change in the way you handle your money and what you do with your finances. Part of that is this principle of leadership. I'm going to let God guide me. I'm going to let the Lord lead me. I'm going to experience his leadership. In fact, the Bible tells us in Proverbs, where there is no vision, the people perish. One translation says, where there is no guidance, the people fail. And we've got to learn that there is a guide, there is an instruction manual, there is a pathway that we can follow, and it's a biblical narrative that's been given us. The scriptures are clearly laid out in all these regards about how we handle our finances, what we do with our money, how we spend our money, and how we handle the affairs of our life. If we could just learn, hey, I'm a manager, but I have to account to that Lord and I will follow the biblical leadership that he gives me. Principle number four is this. It's the principle of contentment. Boy, this is a hard one for folks. First Timothy 6 says, if we have food and covering, with these we shall be content. Not too many people can say that today, can they? If we have what we need, we'll be content. But those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a snare and many foolish and harmful desires. That's where we're at today. We're inundated with foolish and harmful desires. Everywhere there's a commercial there. It tells us we've got to dress like this, look like this, drive like this, be like this. Many foolish desires will plunge people into ruin and to destruction. For the love of money is the root of all evil. What is love and money? But this is where we are as a culture. You know, we got the elections and everybody's talking about, you know, uh, uh, 
rewarding success or putting down success. Hey, success is a good thing as long as it's done for the glory of God in our life. And long as what God is able to do with us once we are successful is to honor him with what we have. But we've got to learn at some point to be content. Too many people deep, deep, neck deep in credit. Some people drowning in credit. And it, it was so easy to get into, wasn't it? Oh, you can have that. It's just 10, you know, $100 down, $10 a month. Well, I can do $10 a month. Hey, anybody can do $10 a month? Sure. But not only is $10 down, or $100 down, $10 a month, how many months is that? And you add it to the other $10 a month, and the other $15 a month, and the other $25 a month, and the other $50 a month, plus your light bill, <coughs> your sewage bill, your water bill, and all those other utility bills, and then your gas bill, and your car gas bill, and all the other bills, and pretty soon you can't breathe. It was just $10. And $10, and $10. <coughs> Excuse me. The tragedy is today that most, especially young married couples, they want to have all the things that their parents have. And they don't realize that their parents spent their lifetime acquiring things and having stuff. But they want all those same things. The principle of contentment. Then there's the principle of faithfulness. Proverbs 28 talks about the faithfulness. A faithful man will abound with blessings. Now, I believe faithful has to do with I'm faithful with God. God gives me. I have a standard. I have a weekly standard that I'm going to give back to the Lord. God blesses me. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm i going to choke to death this morning. Some of you get paid monthly. You know what you ought to do? Monthly, you ought to be giving something to the Lord faithfully. Some of you get paid weekly. Weekly, you ought to be setting aside and honoring the Lord faith what you've got. Some of you get paid bi-monthly. You ought to be bi-monthly giving to the Lord what he has blessed you with and honoring him. It's faithfulness. It has to do with consistency and dependency. Now, our dependency is this. Well, it depends if I want to or not. It depends if I'm at church that Sunday or not. It depends if I, if I got something else I want to do. I may have a vacation. I may have a, a something else I want to buy. I'd almost be willing to line up every one of you that give faithfully each week, and you give a percentage that the Lord has told you to give, and it, obviously you'd start with at least 10%, and put you on one side of the auditorium, and then take everybody else that doesn't do that on a regular faithful basis and put you on the other side of the auditorium, and I bet you we've just sorted out the folks who are seeing the blessings of God and those who aren't really seeing the blessings of God. Those who are constantly struggling versus those who are walking in freedom. You want to try it? <laughs> now, you want to solve some of the problems in your marriage? Become faithful with your finances and honoring the, the responsibilities that you have. And the sixth principle of freedom uh, principle is the principle of freedom. So don't be among those who give pledges and among those who become guarantees for debts. In other words, quit co-signing notes. Quit signing notes. <laughs> Quit borrowing. Just quit doing it. You'll find freedom in your life. Your finances shouldn't be a constant source of struggle. There should be freedom. And it goes back, to, I believe, obviously, to the, the principle of contentment. That's just two down. You still with me? Number three, parenting. All right. <clears throat> parenting is a, is a wonderful issue, which I'm going to deal with much greater detail in October. When I do a sermon series starting the first Sunday in October called No Regret Parenting. And I want you to be here for that. I want you to bring your kids and grandkids and children, everybody else you can to be a part of this series because this is an issue that we need to deal with because the world presents some kind of parenting that's not biblical parenting that we need to discover the difference between the two. There are major needs that children have that are, I do not believe are being met today by the parenting standards that are being presented in the world. So we need to get back to biblical parenting. There are several needs that are major needs in the life of children. One, I believe, probably the strongest driver of their soul is acceptance. Every child needs to know that they're loved and to find that acceptance, desire, and drive of their heart met. If you as a parent don't meet that thriving desire for acceptance and approval in their life, they'll find somebody in the world who will meet that need, and it'll probably be somebody you don't want them seeking after. That involves physical affection. It involves verbal affirmation, being available to your children. It involves expression. Kids have to be able to ask questions, express themselves. You have to be willing to give answers. You have to be willing to take time for answers. When your children say, why? That's a valid question 95% of the time. Why is a good question for kids? If they don't know why, then you need to tell them why. Why can't I cross the street? Tell them why they can't cross the street. You know, when you place boundaries with clear boundaries, with understanding, it's amazing how much better kids will behave. But don't ask me why. You slap them upside the head. That's not going to raise your children properly. All right, there's no acceptance there. But another part of, of, of what kids need is identity. I mean, that obviously means that I don't compare my children with each other. 
And I especially don't compare my children with each other to their face. God makes my children and your children, no matter if you have two, ten, one, or fifteen, all unique, and they're always going to be different. They're just different. It's like a brand new page comes out of the, the press. I mean, when that baby's born, it's a and it's a unique page, and it's got to shape that little life certain ways with a certain personality, with a certain bent in life. The Bible talks about you know parents in, in, in Proverbs, learning what that bent of their child is. In other words, God gave them certain attributes and attitudes and personalities that are just built into their life. They're unique. <clears throat> you need to help them discover what that is. You need to discover what, you need to pray over that. God, show me what you're doing in my child's life. Show me what this kid's all about. Show me how I can minister and bring this kid up in the nurture and the admonition of your word. And that means that you have to do, do take time with them and, dis, and, and spend time with them and love them and learn who they are, not only as your child, but learn who they are in Christ because God's made them for a very special purpose. Kids need to be provided with security. Every time, you know, uh, uh, when you're raising my kids in church as a pastor, my kids have seen the, 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 the bad end and the worst end of, of Christians, as well as yours, amen? They've seen parents that come in and... and, and, and you know, divorce. And I remember walking in on my daughter, she's about four years old and she's sitting in the corner crying. Some couple in the church had recently got divorced and she's over there crying. What are you crying about? I don't want you to get divorced. <laughs> Sit down and assure. You know, that's the number one fear of children. It's the number one fear of children. That their parents are going to end up like other people's parents and they're not going to have mom and dad. That's a heartbreaker, isn't it? So we provide security. How? By loving each other. As a husband, as a wife, caring for you, showing that love in front of our kids that we do. I love your mama. I love your daddy. Whatever it is, you show that. You demonstrate that in your life. Your children don't need to hear your disagreements, even your loving confrontations. Those should be handled in private, not in their, not in their presence. You want to bring healthy children and security in their life. Also, one element of this is, is, is having purpose. They understand purpose. They need to know that God has a special plan for them, very special for their life. Now, what we've done on the, is, is just the opposite. We tell our kids, oh, you're so special. Well, they are, but not yet. We give everybody a ribbon. Everybody gets a trophy. Everybody gets a prize. There's no winners. There's no losers. We're just all special. I think I said a few weeks ago, no, you're not yet. God's created you for something special. There's going to be a path of life to walk. There's going to be suffering. There's going to be difficulty. There's going to be fun. There's going to be blessings. There's going to be grace. There's going to be times you feel like there's no grace. Sometimes life's hard. Sometimes life's fun, all right? But God's working out something special in your life. He has a purpose for your life. You want your kids to know that. But there are certain things that are going to have to be earned in their life. Too many kids, they think everybody owes them something because they're special. Listen, Billy Graham's special. We're working on you. I'm not a Catholic, but just in view of what Mother Teresa did, that's admirable, that's special. We're working on you. People have achieved great things for the Lord, and Judson Taylor and all these great missionaries in the past, they're special. God's still working on us. We want to be. But God has made you for something special, and that's what you teach your children, that God has made them for something higher than what the world has to offer. But it takes commitment. There's discipline involved. There's chores. <laughs> chores. Your kids have chores. Your kids don't have chores. You're preparing them for a wreck in life. They need to have chores. They need to be held accountable to do their chores. They need to learn to be productive. They need to be responsible and productive in their life. I say reproductive, not yet. <laughs> Later when you're married. In fact, I believe kids without chores are just not happy kid. I know some of your kids don't agree with that. You need to be a part of the family. and The whole family is a family group. Parenting is a tough job, but God's given us instruction. Man, I, that doctor handed me my first baby. I said, I, I don't know what to do with this. That's what I was saying. I didn't say it. What am I supposed to do now? Be a father. You know, they handed me a second one. I said the same thing. What am I supposed to do now? Be a father. And these, these issues of acceptance and identity and security and purpose, they're so key and so vital in every child's life. It's important that we learn what it means. And it's important to our marriage because children are usually the biggest argument, especially when the blended families come into the scene. 
There has to be an understanding. If you trust that man to, uh, enough to be your husband, then you trust him enough to help discipline your children and to father those children. Unfortunately, well, I don't trust him that much, then don't marry him. That's what I thought you said, a little slow at parts. These are precious vessels that God's placed in our life, precious children. We don't have them very long. Mine were here like that and gone. Just gone. Let's enjoy what God's given us to. They are a blessing, God tells us, and they're a gift and a heritage, and ultimately they belong to God. The last point is pretty, pretty uh, significant. Two more, really, and so we'll, we'll make them quick. Number one is this issue of sex. Hebrews 13, 4, marriage is honorable among all, and the bed undefiled. We talked about the adulterers and the fornicators and what God says about that. But understand, sex inside marriage is a beautiful thing. Sex outside marriage is a destructive thing. God created a man and a woman the way he created him. The devil didn't invent sex. God did. And also God invented a platform for which that to be enjoyed and for that to be fruitful and that to be meaningful, for that to be genuinely intimate. And it was inside marriage and anything outside marriage, the Bible says the bed becomes defiled. And God judges those things that become outside marriage. Sex is a very important part of your marriage life. And even though you might minimize it, you don't want to talk about it, you don't want to think about it, it's still a very important part of your life. God created you that way, and though you may have issues with this, and there may be problems in your own heart and emotional hurts and wounds, you need to find healing in your life, and you need to understand the fullness of this relationship in your marriage and what it can mean and what it will mean. 1 Corinthians puts it pretty simple. When Paul, the Apostle Paul wrote the church, he says, Do not deprive one another. And he's talking about this sexual relationship between a man and a woman. Do not deprive one another except with consent for a time. He doesn't say... Deprive one another if you're mad at each other. Deprive one another if you didn't get what you wanted. Deprive one another as punishment. No. Only deprive one another if you're going to set a time for fasting and prayer. There's a lot of people depriving one another, but ain't them fasting or praying. And the idea is that you would fast and pray together in lieu of that relationship. The greatest blessings of your marriage relationship will be in the context of the intimacy of that relationship. And I know that men and women are different. We know that, that the women by nature are romantic and men are by nature are more visual and physical, you know. Uh, and, 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 and you're operating on two different, two different wavelengths. And we've talked about this at our marriage retreat before, you know. So if you want to get more of a technological illustration, you know, women are like crockpots. Men, microwaves. Unfortunately. But the problem occurs so many times because people just disregard each other in this fashion or they don't think it's important or I'm too tired for that or I don't want to do that or on and on the excuses go. And God's made this to be a very important part of your life. If you miss this, then you're going to miss so much of the vitality of your relationship. Come together, he says. Don't stay apart so Satan doesn't tempt you because of your lack of self-control. God knows you have a lack of self-control. You have a marriage partner. That's the place to have that relationship. It's important and vital part. These are things we also deal with in greater lengths in some of our couples retreats where we talk about them. There's also a great deal of help out there for Christian couples in this regard if you think you need help in that regard. The last point I'll cover here, one of my favorite, in-laws. <laughs> and it's one of my favorites because I was blessed with some godly in-laws. Now, when I first went to speak to my future father-in-law about marrying his daughter, I thought I was going to have problems the rest of my life. He didn't like me. He didn't like my sense of humor, and I'm a funny guy. <laughs> yeah. He didn't, you know, I'm sitting there asking for his daughter's hand in marriage. He's sitting there like he's ready to pull out a shotgun and shoot me. You have to understand that when I asked her hand in marriage, I, I was working full-time in ministry, making all of $50 a week. My hair was down to here. Most of my ministry occurred on the streets, preaching anywhere I could. And he just didn't get that. And he says, well, just son, where do you think you're going to live? Open mouth, insert foot time. 
I was going to bring a little levy to the situation. I said, I didn't see any reason for Kathy to move her furniture out. I thought it was funny. He didn't laugh at that at all. But over time, and not too much time in reality, God began to work in our hearts and brought us and, you know, loved her dad like he were my dad. Man of God. And my daughter walked in with somebody that looked like me and said that, I probably wouldn't have let him out of the house alive. <laughs> at least not slightly crippled. So what's important? Let me tell you some important things about in-laws, and we'll wrap this up with this. One is the principle of honor. You always honor your parents. The Bible tells us children honor your, your, your parents. The Bible says children obey your, your parents. Well, how do you deal with it? Well, as long as you're at home and you're under their roof, you obey your parents. I'm 21. Obey your parents. You're going to live there. You obey your parents. You obey your parents. Well, I don't like that. You obey your parents. That's just it, period. Well, what about? No, just obey your parents. But what happens when you move out and you, be, you, you, you find a mate and you're married? They're, they're still your parents, but now you honor them. You don't have to obey them anymore. And sometimes there are those in-laws who want to come in and dominate the marriage and play an important role that they're not supposed to play. And if you're that kind of in-law, back off. All right? The scriptures make it clear in the book of Genesis, you know, that, that you're not in that role anymore. That that hand has been given in marriage and that, that child and that has become one with another person. You don't let your parents dominate your life. And if you have an in-law like that, you need to tell your spouse, say, this has gone too far. And we're going to have to do something to correct this. But we're going to do it with dignity. And we're going to do it with honoring them and respecting them. The second thing about this, not just the principle of honor, is the principle of separation. Genesis 2, For this reason shall a man leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. You establish your own home. You establish your own life. You establish your own identities. It's just the way it works in the Bible, and it works best in life when we choose the way of the Bible. Then there's the principle of protection. Sometimes you have to protect each other from the parents. Unfortunately, we said there are sometimes that parents are just domineering. They want to come in, take over, tell you how to raise your children, how to handle your finances, how to do everything. You have to lovingly and respectfully tell your parents when they're invading your space. You honor them, but you have to be honest with them. I love you, but hey, you're, you're, this is our space. You know, this is what our life's about. Now, grandchildren are an exception. <laughs> as much as I would like to make them an exception, they're not, all right? Grandchildren should be given time with their grandparents, all right? But grandparents need to re respect your convictions, things you would have on TV, things you would have out on your counter, the language you would use. Even my own daughter rebuked me the other day, lovingly, honoring me, rebuked me, took me aside and says, Dad, we don't use the S word. No, I wouldn't say that word. The word was stupid. We don't use stupid in front of my daughter. And, and you know, it's the same thing that I didn't use when I had her as a daughter. And I wouldn't let, I'd fuss at people if they used that word around my daughter when they were little kid. We don't call each other stupid. And I apologize, but she lovingly and honorably, she set me straight. And I'm glad because that's, that, that was her role and her responsibility. And as a father, I had to honor that as my daughter's wishes for over her child. I didn't want to be, a, you don't want to be a bad influence, do we? So there's that principle of protection that has to be afforded. And then there's the principle of friendship. Your children, it should be that when they leave home and when they have families at home, they should be some of your best friends. My kids call me every day. My, I, I've got a son in Afghanistan I hear from every day. Whether it's a text message, uh, I am over Skype or a phone call, you know, he's one of my best friends. My daughter, her mother and her, they're best friends. Her husband, my, we're great friends. I think where parents miss it today is they try to be best friends first and parents later. That never works. If you're more interested in being your child's best friend now while they're at home, you're going to make some major mistakes and you're going to give up some areas of responsibility that you don't need to be given up yet. You're not out to win the popular approval uh, test with your child when you're the parent. It's your responsibility first and foremost to parent them and lovingly set those guidelines and hold those standards and discipline them when they step out of the line and deal with those issues. 
Don't seek to be a friend first. Seek to be parent first. And I believe that when they get old enough and they leave home, then they'll be the kind of kids who will keep coming home or keep calling home and keep writing home because they want to talk to mom and they want to talk to dad. The only exception when parents ought to be living with their children who are married or vice versa, you know, children living with them or them living with the children is in regard to latter years. Now, there may come an instance in life where there's a financial issue, and we understand those things when people have made some dumb decisions financially. They lost jobs and careers are being hindered. There's times we may need each other to help each other those times, but that's not the norm. The time we would mostly stand with our parents and have them to move in the same household with us would be in the latter years. Maybe failing health or age is, is, is an issue. And those in-laws in the house at that point in life, we can be a tremendous blessing to them. They blessed us in our early years. We bless them in their latter years. And we should have that kind of place. And they should have that kind of that openness in our life. Now, we've covered a whole lot, haven't we, today? We've covered a lot of topics. So let me give you a helpful hint. If, if you're going home and you're going to be real and you're going to be honest, you're going to say, hey, I, I really want to take some of this stuff to heart. God spoke to me about one particular issue. Well, here's the way you deal with it. One, first of all, just one issue at a time. Don't say, oh, man, I'm going to bring all five things and all five principles under those five things. We're going to talk about all, you know, it's, you're going to kill each other. <laughs> Just start with one. What's the greatest need you're facing in your family? Have the integrity to deal with it. Have the courage to deal with it. Have the humility, you know, to, to take blame if blame needs to be given and, and to deal with it. Not to find just a, a, a time to emphasize a problem, but the time to find a solution. All right, to, to deal with the issues one at a time. You've got the rest of your life to work it out. All right? You've got plenty of time. You don't have to deal with it all today. One at a time. Then there can be a loving confrontation. Number two, Love is really the issue at the bottom line. It's the bottom line. We've called, been called to love. Every child of God, first priority of their life, love God, love each other. Love others as you love yourself. Isn't that it? In your marriage, supremely so. You love your wife as you love yourself. The Bible says you become one. Husband, love your wife, you love yourself. The Bible goes on to Ephesians and says, and see to your wife that she respects her husband. I remember one of the greatest seminars we did in, in our couple street, and they're all great. They've all been dynamic, and everyone's unique and deals, changes unique when we do our, our annual couples retreats. But listen, when we do them, uh, one year we did this issue uh, based upon a book that had been written that year called Love and Respect. If you've never read the book, even if your marriage is going well, you ought to read this book. Half of it's written for the, the man, half of it's written for the wife, and how to deal with issues and problems and loving confrontation. But it says the bottom line is everyone wants to be loved, and every man wants to be respected. But out of genuine love, I believe respect will flow. You'll respect her, she'll respect you. Because that's the, the significance that we seek. But greater than that is, is that we really are not just two individuals. We are one now. And we need to learn how to love and how to honor in such a way that God will do something glorious in your life. This takes time. If you really want a marriage that's successful, it does take some commitment. And it takes discipline. And it takes a wisdom from God. That means you have to learn. It means you have to, it means you have, to have a teachable spirit. And so many people aren't. You know, we'll change the oil in our car every 3,500, 4,000 miles, like clockwork, keep that engine running. But when it comes to our marriage, we never service it. And we wonder why the engines in our marriage is sputtering, overheating, friction, problems, throwing a rod, lives messed up. That's why, you know, many, many years ago, when we first started the church, we started doing this. Originally began at church. Yeah, it's not even, do I, have a, do I have a couple's retreat banner up there? Well, if I don't, it's all right. You can back up. Every year, for 20-something years now, we've gone and left the church facilities and started giving a great deal, a greater more amount of time to our marriages in our church. It has been a tremendous source of blessing and for marriages in our church for many, many, many years. Not only that, we have dozens of couples that come from other churches and other places in the country. We've had them come from out of state. We've had, we've had them come from across the street, just many places. Many people have come to be members of our churches because of our couples' retreats, our marriage retreats. They've been fascinating times in the Lord. And they, but they, it's, it's something that takes a commitment. It's something that takes a little time. It's something that takes a little money that you're willing to invest in your marriage relationship. So every year we have our marriage our marriage retreat. This year, it's in Galveston. And second week, I, end up, I believe, full weekend in, in October, 11th, 13th, 12th, 13th, like that. If you're married in this room, you owe it to your marriage, whether you've been married a short time or a long time, just to make this something you do annually, just to, just to keep the engine 
clean and vital and, and sharp and, and moving forward to, to deal with things that are in your, in your life. You'd be surprised if people get committed to, to ministering to their marriage on this kind of level, what God will do. It's not a guarantee that everything's going to work out right, but I can tell you what, it sure increases the odds that things are going to go better in your life. None of us wants to end in the flames of divorce in our life. Those who've experienced it know the heartache, you know the sorrow of it, you know the pain of it, you know how difficult it is. All right? So what we want to do and what we do every year with our church is we have this time where we take people aside this year just to Galveston, hour and a half down the road, and we take some time just to teach and instruct them what does the Bible say. Every year the topics are unique. They're different. Principles are the same, obviously, all across Scripture, but we just focus in on different areas and different areas of ministry and needs that we feel as the leadership of the church are the key areas that we could minister to our churches. So it doesn't matter if someone comes who's, who's been to every t retreat or just comes to the first retreat. They're getting something fresh every time. They're getting something new. They're getting something that revises them, something that reminds them, and something that helps them. You'd be surprised how many years. Some, there's some of you who've been to every one of them in this church. You know, and, and the only one you might have missed because you were sick or having a baby or something going on. But you've been to multiple retreats, and you've seen, if you'll just take the time to rehearse in your mind the blessing, what God did in your marriage, and how it helped, and how it resolved some issues in some parts of your life. I don't take this lightly. We just don't throw a retreat out there to have a retreat. We do it because God, number one, has given us this area of ministry. Very few churches are doing this kind of ministry. Very few. Because it takes commitment, it takes time, it takes a lot of planning, it takes, you know, just, just a lot of stuff goes into putting one of these together. This year, Pastor Nick Harris, who has done a great job in the past, will be one of the teachers. I'll be the other teacher this year. Every year we do it kind of different, it's unique. Sometimes staff members are doing it, sometimes guests do the whole thing, sometimes it's a mix and match of, of different people and things. But this year will be pa Pastor Harris and myself. And the theme is we are one. We are one. God made us one. And most couples never discover the unity of that. They never discover the depth of that. So we want to focus in on what that means. I'll be looking at some, some very uh, deep theological stuff from the Old Testament with Adam and Eve and what God did there in the garden and how he made them on, and what that means and what their names literally mean when God created them and gave them the name of Adam and Isha. All right, so these are, these are truths and principles that will transform your marriage if you're interested in having your marriage transformed. I pray that you are. I pray that before you leave this place today, you'll go out there at the back table. Maybe it's still stuck in your Bible from last week. You got a brochure. Over on the left side, as you leave the auditorium, there's a screen up that's talking about the conference. There's a big banner there. Grab one of those forms. Sign up today. Now, there's just a couple of weeks left to sign up. They, we have to start releasing rooms soon. So if your name's not on one and you want to get that price guaranteed, then you need to get signed up post haste and come be a part of this retreat. Say, Brother Joe, it sounds like you're promoting the treat instead of preaching. I am preaching. Amen. This is important. This is valuable. This is helpful. Well, we've been married 104 years. Yes, you do. You've probably grown lax and lazy and just, you know, you kind of come in, you found your spot, you're comfortable, and you both have needs that you can still be meeting in each other's lives that will transform you and bring more fulfillment, more happiness, more grace, and more blessing of God to your life and marriage. Don't pass this up. This is a tremendous opportunity. And if God spoke to your heart about these issues today, if, it, if you looked at this sermon today and you're just saying it with all this conviction, you're like, oh, man, I need to work on that. I need to deal with that. I mean, why, we're not, we're, you know, we can't get along in this area. And we, you know, we just stay away from that. You know, God doesn't want you to deal with your issues like that. God wants you to walk right in in freedom. We'll be talking, preaching, and teaching on how to have those kind of freedoms in your life so that your marriage is everything God intended to be. And what is that? A representation of the marriage of Jesus Christ in the church. That's what God wants people to see when they see your marriage, of what salvation and the glory of salvation is really all about. The family, the unity of your home, representing the unity now you have with God your Father and with the Lord Jesus Christ. Take this opportunity. It's important. Now, I made that a part and part of my sermon because it's an important part of our lives. Don't let this moment pass you. If your husband says, well, he don't want to go or I don't want to go or I don't know if we got enough time off, hey, you, you can make this happen if you want to. We always do what we want to do, don't we? Yes. Come on. If I want to go play golf today, I'm going to figure out a way to do it. I will. If I want to go fishing today, I will find out a way. I'll make it happen. If I want to go shopping, you know, ma'am, you can make it happen. All right? 
we do what we want to do. My prayer is that God has stirred up in your heart the want to, to do this in your marriage. No matter how many times you've been, there's always room for improvement. Would you stand? I do believe God wants to say a word to us as we close today and speak to our hearts. And I believe it's.